Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Kimball Art Museum and our interviewer, Linda Mao, speaks with curators George Shackelford and Pam Parmel about their exhibition, Casanova, The Seduction of Europe. Now for Art This Week. I'm Linda Mal, and today I'm at the Kimball Art Museum speaking with Dr. George Shackelford about the exhibition, Casanova, The Seduction of Europe. George, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Always delighted, thank you. I'm really excited about this exhibition because it takes a pretty unconventional approach to exploring a century of art history. It's true. Can you tell me how the idea of using Casanova's biography came into play? Well, I wish I could take credit for it, but it's my good friend C.D. Dickerson, uh, a Fort Worth native who is now has left the Kimball and is head of sculpture and decorative arts at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And C.D., while reading Casanova's memoirs, which extend to nine volumes, uh, got the idea that Casanova was the perfect lead-in for an ex exploration of life in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. Because Casanova went all over Europe, met everyone who mattered in a way, uh, wrote it all down eventually, and, and experienced virtually all kinds of life, from the, the low-life theatricals that he was born into to the high life at the court of Versailles with Louis XV and Madame de Pompadour. Mm -hmm. So that range of experience and that um, interestingness of a life really made him an ideal guide to the 18th century. Absolutely. And also he lived to a, a sort of a ripe old age yes. for the time Yeah, period. he was in his 70s. Mm -hmm. So he really did live across Europe, it's across true. the 18th century. It's true. Casanova is bound to have been one of the most best, one of the best traveled men of the 18th century. We reckon that he logged about 40,000 miles of European travel right. over the course of his life, which is just an extraordinary thing when you imagine that it's all by horse-drawn carriage. Right. Um, he might have gotten on a boat to go to Constantinople, but basically mm -hmm. he was doing it all uh, overland. And the, um, the experience of that and the, his uncanny ability to get, him to in, get himself introduced to the right people means that he had this uh, remarkable experience. And, uh, and because of that, and also because of his testimony to it all, where mm -hmm. he talks in detail about you know, what kinds of food he liked to eat and what kinds of clothes he wore and uh, where he lived and such, we were able to evoke Casanova's world um, to the greater understanding of that world, more broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. So he, he's, our, he's our way into a subject. He's not the subject of the exhibition necessarily. He, the subject of the exhibition is really his world and right. his imagination. So this exhibition includes objects in a variety of media. It's true. And can you tell me a bit about the decision to use the furnishings and textiles as a, as a part of that story? Well, we were... Uh, we were lucky to partner with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which has an extraordinary collection of 18th century art in every medium. They're particularly rich in great costumes of the 18th century, and Pam Parmel was the uh, head of fashions and uh, textiles at the MFA, picked these extraordinary ensembles to use on mannequins that are not just standing there doing nothing, it's not, they're not necessarily a display of the costume per se. They're on a person who is having a reaction, having, mm -hmm. a, having an emotion. Also with the great amount of furniture, ceramics, silver, objects of, of extreme elegance, uh, like little snuff boxes set with, with paste jewels. I mean, all of this evokes the, the century in a, in a much more tactile way than when you are simply looking at a flat object, you know, a painting um, or a print. Mm -hmm. And seeing the paintings and then seeing their world kind of expanded into 3D is one of the joys of the exhibition. I want to go into a little bit of detail. I want to have you tell me a sure. few of the major um, maybe life events or locales that are featured in the exhibition, since I think Casanova is this character that I think a lot of people know about broadly, but maybe not so sure. specifically. Well, there are some geographical locales that are particularly important to Casanova that we celebrate in the exhibition. First and maybe most important is Venice, mm -hmm. the city of his birth. And wherever Casanova went, he was a Venetian. 
I mean, it's a bit like being a Texan. <laughs> you know, if you go to Paris, you're from Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when Casanova was in Paris, he was from Venice. And so we start with Venice in the world of Canaletto and Tiepolo, the great painters of 18th century mm -hmm. Venice. And we've got a fantastic ensemble of works by each in this exhibition. And we give you the furniture of Venice, the, the, you know, the beautiful environments that he would have encountered under the protection of the nobles who first mm -hmm. gave him a job. I mean, he was a poor boy when he was born. His mother was an actress, his father was an actor. Um, they were not wealthy people at all. And so he rose through, in a way, his ability to act um, to the heights of society, becoming the friend of, of popes and princes. Mm -hmm. um, so after, Par after uh, Venice, I would say that Paris is the other great location that we evoke with beautiful paintings by Boucher, great works of decorative art, fantastic gilt bronzes, uh, like I said, beautiful snuff boxes, um, fantastic silk dresses and, and, and items from a woman's toilette. Uh, it's, it's a pretty heady gallery, that, that, that Parisian gallery, mm -hmm. because it celebrates the world of, of Paris luxury. And then we take him for a visit to London, uh, which was a very interesting time in his life, though not very long. He was there for less than a year. But he met such interesting people. I mean, he met George III, the King of England, and, and Queen Charlotte. Uh, and he consorted with a lot of Venetians and a lot of, of Continentals who were there mm -hmm. because he never learned to speak English. <laughs> and since the British didn't speak very much of any other language than English, he was a bit locked out. In fact, there's a wonderful painting of one of the great courtesans of the 18th century, the, the greatest courtesan of, um, of the 18th century in England, and her name was Kitty Fisher. And the, the, her fantastic portrait has a kitty fishing for goldfish in it, so it's a nice joke. She was like a kind of Kim Kardashian, if you can imagine, mm -hmm. and he was set up to be introduced to her and, um, and she didn't speak any French or Italian. He didn't speak any English. And he thought, well, this is not gonna be much of a date <laughs> right. um, because we can't talk. Mm -hmm. So he, in fact, canceled the date because he said, in a way, what's lovemaking without language? Mm -hmm. And so Casanova had, an, had a really strong intellectual bent as well. And writing and words, not only spoken, but also, um, also you know, constructed into poems, plays. I mean, he bragged to Voltaire that he had written 2,000 sonnets. Well, that's a, a <laughs> line of hokey. But, right. he, but he certainly wrote a novel, mm -hmm. a science fiction novel during his lifetime, political tracts, guidebooks, um, the story of his life, the story of his escape from prison right. uh, when he was imprisoned in the Doge's Palace mm -hmm. in Venice, the only man ever to have escaped from the Doge's par Palace prison. And he did so over the roofs and down back into the back, down back into the prison, and he got himself let out by an unwary god. So it's it's a it's a, a rollicking life that it he is. that he led, mm -hmm. and uh, and the the episodes in it are are I think wonderfully brought to life by not just by texts and and you know prints on the wall, but by great works of art. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of which are, in fact, great engravings of prisons by Piranesi or fantastic scenes by Hogarth in 18th century England. Uh, but, you know, Boucher, Fragonard, Tiepolo, Canaletto, um, Joshua Reynolds, you, you name it, mm -hmm. they're, they're here in this exhibition and uh, with works of astonishing quality. I love that uh, you mentioned Hogarth because I was kind of chuckling as I was going through the exhibition of, of all of Hogarth's works. And I think, and especially even his body of work that I know of outside yes. of this exhibition, I think that um, Casanova might have been who Hogarth was talking about yes, most of the time. absolutely. <laughs> so Cas I thought he was a perfect person to yeah. include his artwork in this exhibition. Yeah, Cas uh, Casanova is the kind of rake that, uh, that Har uh, that Hogarth liked to to track the life yeah, of, yeah, to, to poke fun at, it, to poke <laughs> yeah. fun at, and uh, and you know Casanova was in fact, I mean, he was a rake, he was a roué. Uh, I'm sure from time to time he was a cad, um, cheat, womanizer, but also fascinating conversationalist, mm -hmm. incredibly um, quick-witted, and you know could 
con his way into inventing the French national lottery and making money off of it, you know, <laughs> and suddenly becoming a millionaire, mm -hmm. um, and then going back to be poor after right. that. I mean, he, he, he had this life that was a, like a roller coaster, and he, um, and, you know, he describes it with such wonderful honesty in his memoir. He doesn't, you know, he takes the mask mm -hmm. off and, and tells you who he is in this book. So it becomes a, a great way of sort of looking through a, I mean, through, definitely through a lens, but without too many filters in it. Right. Uh, looking back into the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And I like the way that this exhibition sort of pairs things that are very specific to Casanova's mm -hmm. biography with things that, that are more broadly That's the right. context of the 18th century That's right. Europe. I mean, we're sitting in front of two paintings by his brother. Exactly. So his brother, Francesco, was a painter, and, and Giacomo, the subject of our exhibition, was always on the lookout for opportunities for mm -hmm. his brother, thinking, I can get my brother a commission here, I can get my brother a commission there. And so behind us is this great scene of a, of a carriage wreck. Mm -hmm. um, the bridge has gone out and the carriage and its horses are falling off into the ravine. Um, in front of it we have a real 18th century truck which doesn't have anything, a trunk which doesn't have anything to, to touch directly on Casanova, right. but is a traveling trunk that has survived from the 18th century. So it's much like he would have Much used. like exactly, exactly the kind of thing that he would have used. Mm -hmm. And it's a rare thing to be able to see because uh, you know, a, a, a period trunk, well it's luggage, it's old luggage, you know, mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a fine object like a chest of drawers or a, or a beautiful table. Mm -hmm. and, and so we we're able to evoke his time through ordinary objects as well as rather refined mm -hmm. ones. Going off of that, I want to mention these two paintings of Dresden by Bellotto. Yes. So of course they're gorgeous and they're fantastic paintings, but they're sort of unique for, they're really showing a snapshot of daily life in, in a way that we think of now as, as very accurate. Absolutely. And so again, this, this exhibition is marrying the, the, the highbrow with the everyday. It's true. The, the great paintings by Bellotto that are in this exhibition, and by the way, we hope to bring you more of these later on, uh, but the two that are here from the North Carolina Museum of Art are extremely fine examples mm -hmm of these large-scale landscape paintings of a very specific place. Uh, Bellotto was brought to Dresden to depict the new city, the mm -hmm. city that was being erected by Augustus Strong and Augustus III, the electors of Saxony then. And he uh, made these paintings that were fundamentally architectural views, but to give them life, he filled them with little views of people. Mm -hmm. So a woman going to market with her cows, uh, a couple standing and discussing something on the banks of the river. There, there are all of these details that make you feel like you're there. Mm -hmm. And Bellotto's um, painting style is so realistic and spe specific. In, in fact, his paintings are being used for the reconstruction of Dresden after the bombing of 1945. Right. And so nowadays people are going to Bellotto's paintings of the 18th century as reference points for what the new Dresden, the reconstructed Dresden should look like. So it, 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 those are exact, and he was mm -hmm. in Dresden, and he wasn't in Dresden at the same time as Bellotto. So right. we really pinpoint him at a place where he, um, he lived and studied and enjoyed himself. The last thing I wanna talk about is the closing gallery of this exhibition. Sure. You've given it the title, In the Company of Great Minds. Can you tell me a bit about the objects in this room? Well, in fact, the closing gallery is like a, a, an episode of This Is Your Life. When C.D. Dickerson, who conceived the exhibition, came to me to talk about the, the show, he said, I'm having trouble figuring out how we should end. Because in fact, the real ending of Casanova's life is rather sad. He mm -hmm. becomes the librarian to a very minor nobleman in Bohemia. And so he's not having a glorious Parisian finale to his career mm -hmm. holding a great salon. And he's alone as a, as a librarian in this library, writing about himself. And it seemed to me that the way to conclude it was to introduce you at the end of Casanova's life to the people that he would have remembered over the course of his life. And so the gallery opens with fantastic marble busts from the Metropolitan of Louis XV and Madame de Pompadour, who was certainly the most powerful woman in France mm -hmm. during the reign of, uh, of Louis XV. We give you Catherine the Great of Russia, George III of England, all people that he knew and admired. 
um, artists like Anton Raphael Mings or Mings' Portrait of the Pope, Clement right. XIII, and then a series of intellectuals with whom Casanova wanted to be remembered. Mm -hmm. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau, his friend, Samuel Johnson from London, the great author of the Great Dictionary, uh, Voltaire, with whom he carried on a long correspondence, and finally, an unexpected figure, Benjamin Franklin, mm -hmm. the American scientist and patriot who uh, Casanova met in Paris in 1783. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a gallery of, of great, great famous and important people of the time who might not have ever known each other, right. but who in common had friend Giacomo Casanova. He is, as I've said before, the one degree of separation mm -hmm. in the 18th century. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today. George. My pleasure. My I hope pleasure. everyone will come and enjoy the extra. I hope so too. And it's here all the way through the end of the year. That's December right. 31st. The last day is New Year's Eve. Perfect. So come and celebrate with Casanova. I'm here now with Pam Parmel to talk about the textiles in the exhibition and a little bit about the tableaus. Can you tell me a bit about uh, the way that you helped contribute and decide on the textiles to use for this exhibition? Sure. My role in the exhibition was to actually choose the garments you see on the mannequins, accessorize them, and then oversee the dressing of the mannequins. And there are three tableaus, and each tableau has three figures in them, yes. so we have a variety of of male and female costumes and somewhat of a variety in, in class stratification. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the way that you decide on which costumes to use for these? Sure. Uh, the MFA's collection is ex actually very rich in 18th century dress, although uh, not as rich as you might expect. So we had to be very careful about which costumes we were able to use in which vignette. Yeah. <laughs> we wanted them to kind of follow Casanova's career, starting earliest in Venice, where he was um, in the 1740s, 50s, then moving on to France in around the 1750s, 60s, and then in England, 1760s. So there is a type of chronology mm -hmm. that we wanted to keep with the costumes. Um, so you see some of the earlier women's dresses in the first vignette, and then 1760s dresses in the later <laughs> ones. And the menswear, the collection is not quite as rich. So most of the menswear is from the later part of the century. I also found it really interesting. So you also were paying careful attention to the, the region. For example, there was an Italian silk dress for the, early, for the early vignette when he was in Italy. And then there's this beautiful um, British silk um, object in the third vignette. Can you tell me a bit about the differences or the things someone might be able to pick up on the differences in these sure. two types of garments? The um, Italian dress that you're looking at has a very wide panier and you can actually look at some of the paintings in the exhibition and see women wearing similar dresses. And during the 18th century, actually the, those panniers really controlled how you moved mm -hmm. because they were so wide, they extended almost a foot and a half on either right. side of your body. Getting through doors or maneuvering through crowds was very tricky. You can just imagine. <laughs> yes, and that, that was actually a sign of your status and your you know, bearing, how you were trained to move. It was a sign of you know, that you were a woman of, of high social class. What types of different patterning might you see across the time period? The, some of the more elaborate silks are actually from the earlier part of the century, and you see that in the first two vignettes. They're incredibly detailed. Um, the silk on the lady with the panier is called a lace pattern silk. Um, the patterns relate to laces of the period a little bit. Uh, and then as you move through the show, the morning scene, the second scene, which is a, a la toilette, which is a woman getting dressed, the dresses are much simpler mm -hmm. because in the morning you wouldn't have anything quite, quite so elaborate on. But pay attention to the trim on the lady who's sitting at the toilet table. Uh, it's really elaborately trimmed. It's a beautiful dress. Mm -hmm. And then the last vignette, which is set in England, features a woman's dress of English silk and the English love flowers, and I think that comes through in many of the textile designs from the English. And lastly, I just want to ask about the use of the, the printed cotton dress in the second vignette. Can you tell me the significance of that type of garment for this time period? Sure, that's a dissertation. I could go oh. on forever <laughs> about that. But cotton was actually uh, not very commonly used in Europe until the end of the 17th century when they began trading with India. The Indians were very famous for their printed cottons. 
and they had really developed um, the ability to print cottons that would not fade when they were washed. And that, the Europeans did just not have that kind of cotton. Linen is not easy to print on. So they were a revelation because you could easily wash them. The silks and wools that you mostly see in dress from 17th, 18th century were very difficult to clean. So cotton uh, became used throughout the 18th century. By the middle of the century, the Europeans were actually printing on cotton. So the dress you see in the second vignette worn by the servant girl is a European printed cotton from the period. And I know I said lastly, but there's something so interesting sure. I wanted to have you to explain because you would be the one to know about it. Can you tell me a bit about the mask culture in Venice in the 18th century? Sure. Uh, masking is complicated because in Venice in the 18th century, it has a lot to do with status. There was a very hierarchical culture throughout Europe during this period, but even more so in Venice. And if you were of an up, upper class, um, you expected deference um, to you by everyone beneath you. So you either had to bow to that person or do something. And when you were out in public, this became very complicated. Um, so people went out in public masked. Of course, you knew what class they were by the clothes they were wearing, <laughs> but the mask, you know, kind of made it not necessary. It sort of to, was an excuse. An, an, an excuse in a way, sure. Thank you so much You're for welcome. speaking with me. I really appreciate it. Love That's the my pleasure. We want to thank George and Pam for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to KimballArt.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar